Thank you very much, Carl, and uh, it's great to be here. It's a real pleasure to be at this, uh, this Chesterton Conference, the, the legendary Chesterton Conference. <laughs> this happens to be my first, but it is a, is a, is a real delight to be here. Now, unfortunately, um, this event has coincided with the ordination of a good friend of mine, who's the date of which was sort of up in the air until three or four weeks ago, and it was scheduled for this morning. So I have to give this paper and really dash into the into the city, to the to the cathedral. So it's a great joy, obviously, two two good things. But uh, so luckily, Carl has been able to schedule me first. But it, I don't think it's a bad thing because my my presentation is. Is sort of outside the theme of today's conference. So, in a sense, I'm a, a little bit like the support act, you know, when you go to a, a concert. Well, when I you did in my younger days, go to a rock concert, and there'd be some support act that no one had ever heard of uh, on beforehand. And uh, just to whet the appetite, usually people would be talking and carrying on during this act, waiting for the main, main event. So if you, you know, I'm happy if you, if you want to do that. Um, I know the main, the main things will be happening after. So this will just be a, a little, to, to whet the appetite at least for those of you who are, who are, who are listening anyway. Um, so it is a great pleasure to be here. In, in preparing this paper, it was, it was great to to be reminded of the importance of G.K. Chesterton in my own, um, I think, spiritual development when, I, when, I, when my own faith was reawakened in, in, in my early 20s. Um, one of the authors I was introduced to was, was, was G.K. Chesterton, and, and I did read a number of his works, and, and, um, and particularly, and it still remains probably my favourite of his work, um, The Everlasting Man, is something that I, I return to again and again. And, and um, you know, I taught uh, and taught for many years at Notre Dame uh, the subject of Christology, and um, the Everlasting Man was always a, a lovely book to return to. And it's not a, obviously with Chesterton, you're not dealing with necessarily a scholarly work, but it really grounds one's theology and, uh, in 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 in, um, in a more uh, real sense, I think. Um, so Chesterton has always been in the back, sort of lurking there for me as I've journeyed in my, um, I suppose, academic life. And although I wasn't, wasn't engaged with him directly, he was always there sort of as a reminder of the importance of common sense. And particularly in academia, and I think particularly in, in theology even, there's, sometimes there's a lack of common sense and uh, a lack of um, trying to relate the great truths of faith to, as Chesterton would describe, the common man. And I think uh, Chesterton has always been a great reminder to me about that. So this, this paper um, is a look really at Chesterton's philosophy of the human person. And um, we'll give a brief personal, because I'm not a Chesterton scholar, so really a brief personal look at uh, Chesterton's view or philosophy, to give it a grander term, of the human person. Um, now, he never wrote a specific study as such on the human person as, as, a, as an academic. Um, however, throughout his work, there lies a profound depth of thought and wonder at the nature of man. It's hoped that this paper will present something coherent, for in many respects, as you, most of you are more aware than me perhaps, Chesterton was an anti-intellectual, preferring to shock the reader with strange analogies and paradoxes. He was, in some respects, more an entertainer and stylist than an intellectual, and all power to him for this. However, this paper hopes to demonstrate that it is possible to find scattered throughout Chesterton's writings a thorough and profound answer to the question of what is the human person. So a brief overview of this paper. Um, I'll begin with a quick sketch of Chesterton's worldview before looking at his philosophy of the human person. I'll then address, which is the, the topic of the paper, or the, the heading of the paper, what the basic dilemma of the human person is and Chesterton's solution. So, first, Chesterton's worldview. Although Chesterton did not enter the Roman Catholic Church until later in life, his worldview or basic philosophy was consistently Catholic. He held that the reality of God was the focal point of human existence and history and that the incarnation of Jesus Christ is the revelation 
of this God who is personal, loving and triune. As an orthodox, small o orthodox Christian, Chesterton believes that man was created in God's image. His body, soul, reason, imagination and will are all gifts from God and each individual person is a unique reflection of the divine majesty. However, the goodness of the human person is not perfect in this world and Chesterton was a fierce defender of the doctrine of original sin. It is through the lens of this orthodox Christian faith that Chesterton viewed the world and upheld the dignity of the human person. He was particularly interested in defending common man and the institutions of common man. His church, his home, his family and, very importantly, even his pub. In moving towards the Catholic faith, Chesterton came to admire two of the Church's greatest saints, Francis and Aquinas. In St Francis, Chesterton saw a truly human reflection of God's love, a man who walked the world like the pardon of God, showing that men could be reconciled to God, to nature and to themselves. In St Thomas, Chesterton found a thoroughly intellectual and plausible account of what he had always intuitively believed, that everything that exists truly matters, that there is wonder in all things. As Ronald Knox noted, and I quote, it was, favorite, it was a favourite principle of Chesterton that it, is, that it is possible to see a thing again and again until it has become utterly stale to you by familiarity and then suddenly to see it for the first time. It was possible to have a vision of the truth in the same way, to see a thing as it really is for the first time, because all your 999 previous glimpses of it has given you a merely conventional picture of what it really is, and thus missing its essential truth." Unquote. For Chesterton, it was important to have the innocence of a child to appreciate the wonder and truth of things. His worldview was in many ways that of a child. Chesterton states, what was wonderful about childhood is that anything in it was a wonder. It was not merely a world full of miracles. It was, miracu it was a miraculous world like a hundred windows opened on all sides of the head. Chesterton showed a great mistrust of anyone who tried to rationalise everything, leaving nothing to the imagination or to the mystical. To be wise, according to Chesterton, one has to be innocent. So Chesterton's philosophy of the human person is signified by his approach that was deeply affected by his natural affection and love for all people. He once wrote whimsically that he would like to meet all people. Mr. Gilbert, Ch Mr. Gilbert Chesterton requests the company of humanities, requests the pleasure of humanities company to tea on December 25th, 1896. For Chesterton, any real philosophy of the human person must begin with the uniqueness of the person. Like all things, there is wonder to people. He wrote, The startling wetness of water excites and intoxicates me. The fieriness of fire, the steeliness of steel, the unutterable muddiness of mud. It is just the same with people. When we call a man manly, or a woman womanly, we touch the deepest philosophy. In his book, The Everlasting Man, Chesterton argues, contra the evolutionists and materialists, that the human person differs in kind and not in degree from the animals. The evolutionists of Chesterton's, Chesterton's time, and many to this day, saw the human person as an animal with some culture added on. He argued strongly against the idea that art, language, literature, family, etc. were simply an evolutionary advance from primitive man who had evolved from the apes. 
When man sings praise to God, he is not making an instinctive animal noise. Chesterton was not so much, to be sure, interested in evolution as science. Rather, he was perturbed when the philosopher, or the psychologist, takes the theory and concludes that the human person is ultimately no different from the ape from which he is evolved. For Chesterton, the more we really look at man as an animal, the less he will look like one. In The Everlasting Man, Chesterton takes particular issue with H.G. Wells and his outline of history, which concludes that caveman, that the caveman was the first of many evolutionary stages for the human person that will be ultimately realised with a type of utopian society when man has reached evolutionary perfection. Chesterton sets out to debunk the myth of the caveman, using the only known evidence of primitive society known at the time, the simple drawings of animals found in the caves. Chesterton demonstrates the primitive man was truly man. He was not half person, half ape. He writes, the most primitive man could draw a picture of a monkey. It would be a joke to think that the most intelligent monkey could draw a picture of a man. Furthermore, monkeys did not begin pictures and then men finished them. The horse was not an impressionist, and the racehorse a post-impressionist. <laughs> Indeed, for Chesterton, art is the signature of man, and therefore, if the caveman drew portraits of animals, he is truly man, not half man, not half ape. Unlike some contemporary philosophers, Chesterton would have no problem with being labelled a speciesist. He says, man is at once the exception to everything and the mirror and the measure of all things. That is, the human person is different and superior to all other living things. He is in fact a stranger on earth. He differs in kind to animals in a myriad way. In myriad ways, he clothes himself. He cannot trust his instincts. He is both a creator and a cripple. He has a mind that doubts, dreams and knows things, and importantly for Chesterton, alone among the animals, he is shaken with the beautiful madness called laughter, as if he had caught sight of some secret in the shape of the universe, hidden from the universe itself. Chesterton's fierce upholding of the uniqueness of the human person extended to his defence of free will. Contra the determinists of his day, Chesterton saw free will as a given. In his autobiography, Chesterton, with his characteristic wit, stated, I regret that I cannot do my duty as a true modern by cursing everybody who made me whatever I am. I am not clear about what that is, that is, what I am, but I am pretty sure that most of it is my own fault. For Chesterton, determinism, whether of the materialist or Puritan variety, is dehumanising. One of the human person's most no noble characteristics is his ability to choose between good and evil, to overcome adversity and conquer obstacles. Chesterton saw the truth of free will as a matter <coughs> of common sense. Any notion of morality or ethics hinges on it. The one who represents all thoughts, he writes, as an accident of environment, is simply smashing and discrediting all his own thoughts including that one. Furthermore, far from freeing the human person from religious dogmas, the determinists in destroying free will enslave man in the prison of his environment. He writes, You may say, if you like, that the bold determinist speculator is free to disbelieve in the reality of free will. But it is a much more massive and important fact that he is not free to raise, to curse, to thank, to justify to urge, to punish, to resist temptation, to incite mobs, to make New Year resolutions, to pardon sinners, to rebuke tyrants, or even to say, thank you for passing the mustard. Throughout his life, Chesterton battled against the very determinists of his time. He knew that any denial of free will would have dire consequences. When human actions are seen to be predetermined, either by one's environment, the behaviourists, or by one's physical matter, the scientific determinists, or by one's God, the predestinationists, 
individual responsibility for my actions is absolved and the notion that I can change the world through my will is thus destroyed. The dignity of the human person is therefore diminished. Kessenden's philosophy of the human person is neatly summarised in a short essay, Philosophy for the Schoolroom. He argues that all arguments begin with an infallible dogma, something that must not be doubted before an argument can begin. He saw the sceptics of his day as quite mad, for they began any debate by saying what they did not believe in. Chesterton held that all sane men believe firmly in four things, which are unproved and unprovable. First, every sane man believes in the reality of the world, that his life is not a dream. Second, the same man believes that this world matters, that there is something intrinsically wrong when someone says, I did not ask for this farce and it bores me. I'm aware that an old lady is being murdered downstairs, but I'm going to go to sleep. Third, that there exists such a thing as self, an I or an ego, which is continuous. And fourthly, the same man believes and in practice assumes that they can choose and are responsible for their actions. Chesterton believed that these four certainties, quite apart from any religious belief or doctrine, are essential in upholding the inherent dignity of the human person. The human person exists objectively. He exists subjectively. He is a moral being able to choose good or evil and is free. This for Chesterton is the common of sense approach to any analysis of the human person. So what is the basic dilemma of this human person? For Chesterton, the metaphor that most aptly describes the human person's dilemma is the man is, is that man is homesick while being at home. We know there is more, something greater, something beyond, and are therefore forever restless. He writes in Orthodoxy, The main problem for the philosopher is to be at the same time both amazed by the world and at home in it. Our separateness from home is for Chesterton another way of talking about original sin. In answer to the question, what is the fall of man? Chesterton answers that whatever I am, I am not myself. He calls this the prime paradox of Christianity, that something that we have never in any full sense known is not only better than ourselves, but is even more natural to us than ourselves. The problem then for man is that he strides two worlds, the spiritual and the material. He is soul and body. If the balance is not right between the two, catastrophe will follow. He writes, this is what I call being born upside down. The sceptic may truly say to be topsy-turvy, for his feet are dancing upwards in idle ecstasies, while his brain is in the abyss. To the modern man, the heavens are actually below the earth. The explanation is simple. He is standing on his head. One of the perils of the human condition is that the human intellect is free to destroy itself. When philosophers, scientists and psychologists proclaim that the mind does not exist, a current of thought that has become perhaps more prevalent since Chesterton, they in fact teach that there is no validity to human thought. Chesterton uses the analogy of the power of one generation being able to prevent the existence of the next generation by all entering a monastery or committing suicide. <laughs> His generation was trying to stop the next from thinking. This he writes, and of course he's a fierce defender of uh, free thinking, this he writes is the only thought that should be stopped. Thus, another dilemma of the human person for Chesterton is the temptation to be trapped in our desire to think our way out of everything, to explain the world away. Thus, his famous statement, 
The madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. This is indeed a trap which will lead, as Chesterton was fond of putting it, to the padded cell or the asylum. We must be willing to straddle the material scientific world as well as the mystical and imaginative world. The failure to do so will result in the prison of the materialists or the asylum of the Gnostics. So what is the answer to this dilemma? Put simply, uh, for Chesterton, the answer to what he called the riddle of man was the God-man. It is in the incarnation where we find the two worlds, the divine and the human, perfectly united. The human person is lost and disorientated between these two worlds. It is in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who bridges them. The central argument of the everlasting man is that the yearnings, the mythologies and the art of the caveman are fulfilled in the God who humbled himself to be born in a cave. Thus, when Chesterton describes the human condition as feeling homesick at home, he proposes that it is in Jesus Christ who points us to our true home, which is in him. As he writes, Jesus is more human than humanity. In his book, Orthodoxy, Chesterton describes his pre-Christian attitudes to the world and the human person. Attitudes that reflect the Christian faith that he would later embrace. He saw these attitudes as an antidote to the problems of his contemporary world. First, the world does not explain itself. Neither the magician nor the scientist can satisfactorily define everything about the world. Second, this world must have a meaning and a purpose, for it is a work of art. This purpose is personal. Third, the world is beautiful, but not perfect. Yes, the world is good, but it is dangerous to deny its defects. And fourth, the fact that the world is good means we need to thank the God who made it that way. Chesterton's attitude was that, in some way, all good was a remnant to be stored and held sacred. Man had saved his good as Crusoe had saved his goods. He had saved them from a wreck. Here, like Kant and Newman, Chesterton is saying that we can arrive at a knowledge of God from an intuition, from our conscience. He believed in God because he thought there must be someone to whom he could give thanks. For Chesterton, mysticism is important because it keeps men sane. The ordinary man is sane because he is a mystic, with one foot in earth and the other in fairyland. He is free to doubt, but also free to believe. He can believe in faith as well as a free will. The healthy person is the person who can balance contradictions. One can therefore see why Chesterton would find the truth of all things in the Catholic religion. The religion of ands rather than either ors. Faith and reason. Nature and grace. Scripture and tradition. Human and divine. Three and one. Spirit and letter. Body and soul. In being a mystic, the human person needs to transcend himself. Chesterton compares the differences of an overemphasis on the imminence of God and a proper understanding of God's transcendence. The first, an overemphasis on the imminence of God, he sees as characteristic of Buddhism, a spirituality of introspection and isolation. <coughs> the latter, a proper understanding of God's transcendence, he associates with Christendom, a spirituality of wonder, curiosity and moral and political adventure. He writes, insisting that God is inside man, man is always thus inside himself. By insisting that God transcends man, man can transcend himself. This is essential for the true nature of the human person to be realised. Also, in answer to the dilemma of the human person, Chesterton saw the virtue of hope as essential in a world characterised by the two extremes of optimism and pessimism. 
He wrote amusingly that the optimist thought everything good except the pessimist, and the pessimist thought everything bad except himself. <laughs> he explains that both the optimist and the pessimist see the universe as though they were looking at purchasing a new home, whereas the more acceptable attitude is something akin to patriotism. The point is, he writes, is not that this world is too sad to love or too glad not to love. The point is that when you do love a thing, its gladness is a reason for loving it, and its sadness a reason for loving it more. For Chesterton, it is the Catholic understanding of a world created by God, a world that is good, but far from perfect, that answers the problem posed by the optimist and the pessimist. We are thus called to be creatures of hope. A further answer to the dilemma of the human person, and a particularly Chestertonian uh, answer, is the crucial need for joy. This joy is not just supernatural, although the source of all joy is God, but also very human. It is expressed in laughter, song, play and nonsense. Chesterton's critique was not just of a drab, pessimistic and overly intellectualised world, but also of an overly pious and serious religion. As he wrote, I do not like seriousness. Seriousness. I think it is irreligious. The man who takes everything seriously is the man who makes an idol of everything. For Chesterton, the great secret of the Christian is joy. The joy that comes from God. In writing about Christ, Chesterton points out how his pathos was natural, that his tears flowed and his anger was open for the world to see. And yet, there was one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon our earth. And sometimes, Chesterton says, and sometimes, and I sometimes fancied, it was his mouth. The human person longs to be happy, and to be happy, we need to be grateful. As David Fagerberg has commented, until we are grateful, we will not find the world miraculous. Until we find the world miraculous, we will not find it important. Until we find it important, we will not be happy here. The difference between ourselves and Chesterton is that we don't think our world is important because it seems ordinary, while he thinks his world is important because he is ordinary. And quoting Chesterton, he writes, I am ordinary in the correct sense of the term, which means the acceptance of an order, the creator and the creation, the common sense of gratitude for creation, life and love. Chesterton's answer to the dilemma of the human person is, as I've, uh, is, is, as I've noted in this paper, um, scattered throughout some of his works, but it lives and breathes in everything he writes. As Christopher Hollis pointed out, the danger of the modern world is that we are so caught up in progress and arguing about irrelevant or secondary points that we can miss the great truths. And I think this is the value of Chesterton's work, where the great truth, for example, of the human person, his dignity and intrinsic value, illuminates nearly every page that he wrote. Chesterton's view of the human person is, of course, the orthodox Catholic position. Man is created in the image and likeness of God, he is subject to original sin, and he has been redeemed by Christ. The lesson of Chesterton, though, is that this truth about who we are is something that we must be grateful for and express with joy. As previously noted, Chesterton saw seriousness, even religious seriousness, as akin to heresy. A religious person needs the imagination of the child if he is to appreciate the wonder of the creator, of creation, and indeed the wonder of himself. The child, he writes, has no need of nonsense. To him the whole universe is nonsensical, in the noblest sense of that noble world, word, 
The child has appreciated this world at a glance, and first glances are best. If the Christian message is true, then surely it is something to be happy about. Theology and philosophy are sciences, but for Chesterton, it's a danger to limit them to reason. The Christian needs an imagination, otherwise he will not see things as they really are. To truly reflect his creator, he also needs a sense of humour. As Thomas C. Peters writes, Chesterton's theology is an assertion that the Creator exists indeed, that this same Creator of the earth and the stars is the Creator of the bacon on the rafter and the wine in the wood, and the God that made good laughter has pronounced them good. We are created in the very image of the God who created laughter, joy, play, nonsense and imagination. Christianity takes the human person seriously, but because it takes him seriously, it acknowledges how wondrous he is. Perhaps this is Chesterton's most enduring message for us today. To a, si- to a s- society that often stereotypes the Christian as taking himself too seriously, or of being moralistic, perhaps a killjoy, of, the, of Christianity being about rules and morality and nothing further. The thought and life of Chesterton can act as a, dis- as a decisive rejoinder. Creator wants us to enjoy his creation, to play in his fields and glory in the wonder of things. For G.K. Chesterton, it is only in Christian orthodoxy that a full account of the human person is found. It is a Christian faith that acknowledges the dignity of man as Imago Dei, reflecting God's love, goodness, truth, beauty, playfulness and, yes, humour. This God has called us to a happiness and joy beyond all telling. To respond to this call, we must follow the words of Jesus, words that Chesterton was fond of quoting. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. Thank you. I do apologise again for having to uh, dash off, um, but I, I, I hope that uh, the paper was able to uh, at least keep you awake for 30 odd minutes or so and uh, whet your appetite for what I'm sure will be a, a fantastic conference here and uh, I really thank Carl for organising today and, and putting on such a tremendous program. So thank you. We'll be stretching things to just have three or four minutes for okay, questions yeah, yeah, and then yeah, that's, that's sure you, yeah, you can leave absolutely. Like a right. yeah. yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a few minutes before Paul has to leave. Um, any questions or comments anybody would like to offer? Yeah, feel free. To, as, I, as I said, I'm not a Chesterton scholar, so if anyone wants, wants to add something, that would be great, I think. Yeah. Right. Be uh, interested in you expanding what you mentioned there about Chesterton being attracted to the Catholic Church course, it was a church of ands rather than ors. That and and or, uh, I think, is really interesting. Can you say more about where it comes from? Um, yeah, I guess the most heresies, and I think Chesterton recognised this, but I wouldn't be able to cite anything here, but most heresies are just a concentration on, on a truth, but to the exclusion of its its paradox or its, um, you know, it's, it's, it's in some, some ways we would say it's opposite, but for, for true Christianity, these these seeming opposites need to go together. So, you know, the human and the divine, the, you know, the spiritual and the material. So if you, if you look at any heresy, it's, it's a focus on one to the exclusion of the other. So, the, you know, the Gnostics denied the material, that they're all for the spiritual, which is a truth, but it's exclusion of the other. And I think Chesterton, even though this, what I was uh, alluding to there was prior to him becoming Catholic, you, you, you see that in his... Writing certainly in orthodoxy, this this basic Catholic understanding of the, and it's a it's a it's a truth of Catholicism. This this holding two seeming tensions in balance. I mean, in the early church, you know those you know the great Christological and Trinitarian debates were, you know, a particular thinking thinker with with all good intentions, really focusing on on one particular truth, but just. 
couldn't couldn't hold it in balance with the other essential truths, and that's really how um, and, and Catholicism and, and the Reformation was clearly taken to a different level than that. You know, faith and, and and good works, faith and reason, and so on. So there's an exclusion of, of one of the tensions. Yeah. Is that um, um, it's a fascinating question like this. You begin to wonder at the uh, origins of these ideas and even something that these um, forebears like his parents. What is, 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 did she speak about that or and he said no? Um, the way his parents the, were they well educated, were they um, just curious to know um, why, why he thought this way. Can I can I request the assistance of <laughs> Of someone else in the in the uh, in the audience there. I mean, it's been a while since I've read a, a biography of Chesterton, so I don't want to pretend I know something that I don't. Um, in terms of his uh, his parents, or what was the know? question? Uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong. What what in terms of Chesterton's parents? What were their and his ideas? Where did you, where his, his ideas did you come, come his from? Ideas? Yep, from where he came His family background was Unitarian. Yep, that's quite that's different from what he became. Yeah. yeah, and not, not intensely religious at all. Yeah. And certainly in his school, he wasn't a was standard so. Anglican background, as is so, many, uh, so, so often the case with converts to Catholicism yeah. in the last century. He, he came from a, a fairly lukewarm uh, Christian background, uh, but an intensely happy home. He had a wonderful relationship, I think, with both his father and his mother. And uh, But he admits in his book Orthodoxy that he was a pagan by yeah. 12, I think, and an agnostic by 16. Uh, he, as far as I can read it anyhow, his schooling didn't do a great deal for him. Uh, I think he tended to have the view of Mark Twain that you shouldn't let schooling interfere with your education. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So it's a very hard question to answer. It's a very good question, yeah. I think. Uh, but but it's, it's not easy to answer. He, he bounced yeah. ideas off his friends at school, didn't he? He, yeah. he did, yeah. yeah. He edited a journal there at St yeah. Paul's uh, yeah. in London where he went to school. Um, and you can certainly see in his notebooks uh, you know, the emergence yeah. of early genius, I think. I mean, yeah. Bernard Shaw called him a colossal genius, uh, even though they hardly disagreed on anything. Um, it was similar to the... the the joke about the two Irishmen that they lived on opposite sides of the street and they could never agree on anything because they argued from different premises. <laughs> <laughs> and Chesterton and Shaw were like that, uh, but they had a tremendous affection for each other and Shaw revered, revered uh, Chesterton. But I think a genius by definition, if Chesterton was, it, it's very hard to say, well, all this is sort of, there's a linear progression here. It, it ain't so, really. One more, if there is one, and then we'll let you go. Thank you, uh, conscious of your yeah. commitments. Is there any other... Uh, well, yes, I it may be more applicable to you, but it, will the paper be available on, on the website? Or yes, uh, I'll, 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 I'll mention, I'll mention that. that. We'll be having... Uh, assuming you're happy about that. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will have your papers yeah. available. Uh, I'm hopeful in both uh, paper form as well as uh, in, uh, on the website. All right, well, Paul, can I just th th thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to, uh, to have you uh, open the batting. Uh, and I asked Paul if he'd open the batting. He wasn't confident that was his normal position. It certainly was not my normal position in the order, I can tell you that. But uh, it's very good to, I think, have a, uh, an overall perspective on Chesterton's worldview and um, the key points about that. Uh, so uh, please join me in thanking Paul Morrissey.